Hi everyone, today is a beautiful day and it would have been impossible to have it without our thermonuclear reactor which we call the sun. Turns out the lightest element in the universe, which is hydrogen, comprises 73% of our nearest star. It is hydrogen that supplies our luminary and by extension us with energy. But how did hydrogen come about? And what properties does it have? Well, let's find out. Still haven't recovered from the New Year vacations? I understand that it's not easy and the lack of working activities affect you. I recommend a small but pleasant exercise for your brain to recover as quickly as possible. Skillshare is a platform where you'll find thousands of online classes and members from 150 countries. Here you can learn creative things that are new to you. Have you been interested in photography for a long time? Now's the time to get started with Skillshare. Want to paint pictures or create designs for logos and companies? This is a perfect start not only for a hobby, but also if you want to change your line of work. Here you will learn not only to create a product, but also to sell it independently on freelance platforms, as freelancers themselves will tell you how to do it. There are no ads on the platform that distract from learning, New premium classes appear every week, and the entire catalog is available with subtitles in Spanish, French, Portuguese, and German. The link to Skillshare will be in the description. According to the generally accepted scientific theory, as the lightest element, hydrogen came about in the universe as a result of a Big Bang. Basically, this means that it was created in a small and highly dense spot. It was as if someone pushed the button, and generation of matter began to form out of nothing. Of course, at first it may sound confusing, but at present there are no other science-based theory. That's why we have got to work with that we have. As a result, out of just one type of atoms consisting of one electron and one proton, billions of stars were formed, and thermonuclear reactions synthesizing heavier elements from simplest hydrogen began to take place inside them. During the life cycle of many stars, hydrogen inside their cores began to run out, and after that heavier atoms such as helium, lithium, oxygen and silicon began to merge together and form iron. Iron atom core can't merge with another iron core, because of the inefficiency of such nuclear fusion inside stars. For heavier elements to form, there has to be thermonuclear explosion, or in other words a supernova, which is such an extreme compression of the star to the point of burning absolutely all of these light atoms, causing a highly strong burst of energy and spread of its content in space. Our star and all the planets around it were formed out of several dust clouds, which formed this way. In turn, we became the end result of all of this. It can be said that we are a celestial dust synthesized from hydrogen atoms that have learned to speak and even collect celestial dust on other planets. But let's move from theory to practice, synthesize some hydrogen and learn about its properties. In our atmosphere, hydrogen is almost not found because it's much lighter than air and easily vanishes from our planet. That's why hydrogen mostly gets chemically synthesized. The most frequently used hydrogen synthesis method is a reaction of metallic zinc with hydrochloric acid. Since chemical properties of hydrogen slightly resemble those of metals, and it's less active than zinc, it's easy to reduce with a more active metal from hydrochloric acid molecules. During this process, it releases gas bubbles streaming out of the laboratory flask. Basically, hydrogen can be reduced from hydrochloric acid using any metal, which is located to the left of hydrogen in the reactivity series. Zinc is used because of its low price and because of being easy to handle. Because of being highly chemically active, the obtained hydrogen burns well in the air, forming a very hot flame, reaching the temperature of about 2000 degrees Celsius, which is 500 degrees more than the temperature of a regular candle flame. This small flame easily melts the aluminum foil, and if we take more hydrogen and burn it with a Bunsen burner, we can easily melt a copper wire with such a hydrogen flame. Besides the conventional and demonstrative methods of hydrogen synthesis, 
there are more interesting ways of extracting it, for instance, using the reaction of metallic calcium with water. Because calcium is a highly active alkali earth metal, it easily reduces hydrogen even from water. Oxygen easily oxidizes the obtained hydrogen bubbles, forming regular water once again. The United States Armed Forces even patented this method of hydrogen extraction from calcium and water in order to be able to obtain hydrogen in field conditions, for instance, for heating food. It's a rather interesting and unusual method, but it's a pity through that this method is expensive and dangerous, because metallic calcium is very active and isn't that cheap. Speaking of aluminum, which can also be used for hydrogen extraction, it's even cheaper and more expensive than calcium. To synthesize hydrogen from aluminum, I'm adding some hydrochloric acid into a big beaker and I'm dissolving some copper chloride in it. After that, I'm lowering a piece of aluminum foil into the beaker that immediately starts reacting with the solution, releasing hydrogen. To amplify the effect, I'm turning off the light and igniting the releasing hydrogen, which burns with a beautiful blue flame because of copper ions in the solution. It's a pity that this reaction runs way too fast. And the obtained hydrogen can only be used for amusing the public and demonstrating how hydrogen burns at lectures. In 2008, American scientists invented an even more interesting hydrogen extraction method from aluminium. To use this method, First, you need to take one unusual metal, gallium, and melt it. Fortunately, because of gallium's low melting temperature of just 29 degrees Celsius, you can melt it with a regular hair dryer. After that, gallium alloys with aluminium, and it happens even at room temperature if you use aluminium powder or finely sliced aluminium foil. As a result, you get what looks like glittering porridge, which is an alloy of gallium with aluminium, which when mixed with water, starts actively reacting with it, releasing hydrogen. In reality, through, it is aluminium that reacts with water, and gallium only helps to remove the protective oxide layer from aluminium surface, serving as a catalyst, which doesn't get wasted. When the reaction is over, gallium just sinks to the bottom, and in theory, it can be recycled to make an alloy of gallium with aluminium again. Unfortunately, because of the high price of gallium, and because of how difficult it is to recycle it, this method of hydrogen extraction has not become commercially attractive. And there is a good reason for that, because a simpler and more convenient method of hydrogen extraction has been available for a long time, which is electrolysis. Using this method, I put together a special setup for extracting hydrogen. I'm pouring in some 5% sodium hydroxide solution, which is a quite strong base, in order to improve electric conductivity of the solution. When I turn on the power supply, a large volume of gas starts being released on the electrodes inside the device, that is hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is being released on the negative electrode, because it gets reduced by electrons running up the cores, whereas oxygen is being released on the positive electrode, because it, on the other hand, releases electrons, which then wrap up the cord and close the electric circuit. Thus, you can break down water into oxygen and hydrogen, which can easily be transferred into a test tube, because this gas is much lighter than air. When ignited, a slight bang can be heard which shows that there was pure hydrogen in the test tube, without oxygen impurities. Because hydrogen is an extremely light gas, it can be used to fuel some flying objects, for instance, such as airships, that were very popular in the early 20th century. Interestingly, because of their enormous size and being easy to control, passenger cabins in such aircrafts were even more comfortable than some first-class passenger cabins in modern airplanes. Unfortunately, this comfort wasn't meant to last long. Because of its high chemical activity, hydrogen is highly flammable. Just look how easily this pile of balloons turn into a huge burning ball. The same thing happened to the infamous Hardenburg airship in 1937, when in front of the amused public a huge hydrogen zeppelin suddenly ignited, 
and began to fall out of the sky with a terrifying howling sound, claiming the lives of 35 people on board. Because this incident received widespread publicity, this tragedy marked the end of the airship era. It was too expensive to fill huge Zeppelin with non-flammable helium, and the new transatlantic passenger jets quickly filled the unoccupied transport niche. Nevertheless, today the flammability of hydrogen still has practical applications in many fields of science and technology, for instance, in hydrogen-oxygen burners that can burn with flames reaching the temperature of our 3000 degrees Celsius, and that produce just one combustion byproduct, which is water. For instance, you can easily melt one of the most refractory metals, tantalum, that was melting point of 3020 degrees Celsius. These days, usually, hydrogen-oxygen burners are used to melt platinum and its alloys, because, for instance, propane-oxygen burners can enrich the alloy with carbon, taken from the carbon dioxide formed during the burning process of such burners. Besides that, nowadays such pure and hot hydrogen flames are mostly used to melt quartz glass for making optical fiber in order to keep the content of the made glass precise. What's really convenient is that you don't need to carry with you a large gas cylinders in order to create such high temperature flames. A small device and a couple of grams of alkali dissolved in water will suffice. In this electrolyzer, under the influence of electricity, water breaks down into what known as oxyhydrogen, that is a mix of hydrogen and oxygen, in an ideal ratio that also burns well in this not-so-big burner, and is able to melt even this piece of volcanic rock. This mixture of gases is also called ban gas, and there is a good reason for that, because when it burns, it can make a loud sound, that's why, for the sake of safety, I will be conducting the next experiments remotely, filling the balloon with different gases and lighting it up with the help of an electric match. This is how a balloon with hydrogen ignites. It's worth to note that in slow motion we can see how first the balloon itself explodes, after that hydrogen mixes with air and only after that it ignites. If we first fill the balloon with pure oxygen and hydrogen in ratio of 1 to 2, then it will act differently when ignited. So-called bang gas really bangs. And if I didn't wear headphones, then I think just one balloon with such gas would deafen me quite severely. Besides this, you can also see how bright a flash is created when an ideal mix of oxygen and hydrogen burns. You can also extract energy from the reaction of hydrogen with oxygen in a safer way, using a special hydrogen cell, which accumulates electricity instead of creating a fiery balloon and a bank as a result of the reaction of these two gases. Here, hydrogen, supplied into the cell, gets oxidized by oxygen from the air on a platinum catalyst, creating an electromotive force. You can even start a small electric motor on other devices, using the obtained energy. Interestingly enough, when using such cells, energy intensity of 1 kg of hydrogen turns out to be higher than that of even the most efficient battery, which is why this gas can be used as a great and self-contained energy accumulator, for instance in manned vehicles and drones capable of flying without refueling for hours. Besides oxygen, hydrogen can also react with other gases, for instance with chlorine, I put together such a setup for this experiment. First, I'll synthesize some hydrogen using the reaction of a piece of magnesium and some diluted hydrochloric acid in the left part of the setup. I'm collecting the obtained hydrogen with a big syringe. After doing that, I'm attaching it to another test tube in which I'll synthesize chlorine using the reaction of hydrochloric acid with species of trichloroisocyanuric acid. It's also used as a chlorine source in swimming pools. After filling the syringe with chlorine and hydrogen in equal amounts, we can start the reaction with the help of a laser. As you can see, a red laser doesn't affect the mixture of these gases in any way, but as soon as I bring a wallet laser close to the syringe, the mixture of gases immediately starts reacting, making a lone bank. The thing is, a mixture of chlorine with hydrogen is extremely sensitive to ultraviolet light, which forms free radicals, 
which starts this reaction. And as a result of this reaction, there forms hydrogen chloride. Besides this, nowadays hydrogen is also used to extract some pure metals from their compounds. For instance, if we put some iron oxide or regular rust into a test tube, then we will see that this oxide doesn't get attracted to a magnet. If we pass hydrogen through a test tube heating it, a reaction of reduction of iron oxide with hydrogen will start. During this reaction, oxides will be turning into pure metallic iron, changing its color in the process. We can verify that there is iron using a magnet, because magnets attract iron powder well. Besides iron, we can also extract other metals using this method. For instance, we can extract copper from its basic carbonate, or malachite powder. As a result, you can obtain highly pure copper powder, which will be difficult to obtain using other metallurgical methods. Besides reducing metals from their oxides, hydrogen can also oxidize some metals. For instance, if we put some active alkali metal like sodium in hydrogen stream, then when heated, hydrogen will be able to react with sodium metal, forming a highly chemically active powder called sodium hydride. When this powder comes into contact with a wet piece of fabric, it immediately starts to break down into metallic sodium and hydrogen. Thus, this chemical can be used in laboratories, for instance, for storing hydrogen, instead of bulky and heavy steel cylinders. Besides inorganic compounds, hydrogen is also used in organic chemistry for hydrating many compounds. For instance, margarine is made by passing hydrogen through a regular vegetable oil with a palladium or nickel catalyst. As a result of this process, hydrogen sticks to triglyceride molecules, turning unsaturated fats into saturated fats. Thus, vegetable oil can be turned into semi-solid margarine, which is much easier to spread on bread, and is more suitable for making bakery products puffy. Well, you have seen the main chemical properties of hydrogen. However, besides the lightest element with just one proton, in its core, there also exists an extremely rare isotope of it, called deuterium. Besides having one proton, its core also has one neutron. In nature, deuterium compounds are 10,000 times rarer than hydrogen compounds. That's why deuterium oxide, or so-called heavy water, is 1 million times more expensive than regular water. Heavy water is mostly obtained using electrolysis of regular water, which contains a small amount of heavy water, or to be precise, 13 thousandths of a percent. Unfortunately, pure deuterium, just like hydrogen, doesn't occur naturally, because of its ability to disperse from the atmosphere into outer space. That's why I'll have to synthesize deuterium by myself for the next experiments. To extract deuterium from heavy water, I decided to use the reaction with metallic calcium in a special setup. As soon as I started dropping heavy water into the calcium granules, the laboratory flask immediately started filling with deuterium gas, which I'm passing through a dehumidifier with silica gel and collecting it into a balloon I had prepared earlier. Like regular hydrogen, deuterium burns well in the air, although because of its large atomic mass, its flame is 16% colder than flames of hydrogen burning in the air, which is why it appears to be more yellowish. Nevertheless, nowadays scientists are more interested not in the chemical reaction of burning deuterium, but rather in the reaction between its cores that releases a lot of energy. For instance, this is what happens during the early stage of star formation. Deuterium atoms start merging inside the not so hot core of a protostar, thus increasing the temperature to 50 million degrees Celsius. At this temperature, hydrogen starts burning, starting a long thermonuclear synthesis inside the new luminary. The first hydrogen bomb, called Ivy Mike, was created in 1952 in the USA using this very principle. Its yield was whooping 12 megatons, which is 1000 times more than the yield of atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima in 1945. This bomb looked like a huge barrel with liquid deuterium, which was ignited by the temperature of the initial nuclear charge. Because of its enormous size and the huge barrel with deuterium, at that time Ivy Mike was called liquid bomb. 
By the way, when two deuterium atoms merge together, then can form a radioactive triton, also known as superheavy hydrogen, which consists of one proton and two neutrons. After lots of nuclear and thermonuclear tests in the 20th century, and also during the work of nuclear plants, the amount of tritium on our planet grew from 2 to 20 kilograms, which are still scattered in the atmosphere. But this poses no threat to people, because the concentration of this isotope in the atmosphere is negligibly small, and it's much easier to get irradiated by radon in a basement than from light tritium in the atmosphere. Nevertheless, in nature, tritium is most frequently formed when cosmic rays hit the Earth and collide with other atoms, for instance with nitrogen. Usually this phenomenon can't be observed during auroras, where atmospheric gases even start glowing as a result of exposure to a powerful stream of cosmic radiation. It's a pity through that tritium cannot be extracted from the atmosphere because of its high volatility and because of being widely dispersed. That's why nowadays, for application purposes, tritium is mostly extracted as a byproduct from the Canadian heavy water nuclear reactors. In these reactors, under the influence of neutron streams, heavy water turns into super heavy water, or in other words, tritium oxide. Gaseous tritium extracted from super heavy water can be pumped into a glass ampule, which does get slightly tainted over time because of the stream of beta particles formed as a result of decay of tritium. Because of its pretty short half life of 12 and half years, this hydrogen isotope is quite radioactive. My dosimeter must probably show the breaking radiation, which forms as a result of absorption of the fast-flowing electrons by the glass walls of the ampule. This property of tritium to radiate a powerful stream of beta particles is used in tritium key chains that so many of us know. Such tritium ampules are coated with luminophore from inside that give off light as a result of absorption of fast-flowing electrons. Besides this, nowadays, Tritium is used in making some organic compounds in order to test how they react with each other or to test how human organism absorbs new medicine. To begin with, under the influence of a catalyst, some hydrogen atoms in organic compounds are substituted with tritium and after that, vapors of such chemicals are sealed in glass ampules for storage. In order to detect compounds marked with tritium, first vapors get frozen in liquid nitrogen. After that, they are separated in a chromatograph and placed in special liquid scintillators, capable of detecting even extremely weak beta radiation in solutions. Huge amount of tritium is needed for such a research, and also for military purposes, as well that is in short supply now, which is why its price now is not low at all. It costs about $40,000 for 1 gram of tritium, and because of its pretty short half-life, every day there is less and less of it on the Earth. And at the end of the video, I want to show you how all hydrogen isotopes behave under the influence of a strong electromagnetic field. Hydrogen, deuterium and tritium in those ampules are under lower pressure, and when they are drawn close to a small Tesla coil, we can see a beautiful glow of these gases. It's worth of note that the heavier an atom is, the more violet glow its gas gives off in an ampule. Well, after watching this video, I think you know more about such an interesting gas as hydrogen. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.